seconds. Hello and welcome to the special. I'm Patricia Gross. Our guest is the new leader at the University of Houston system. She assumed the dual role of chancellor and president on January 2008. She's the first foreign-born leader in the University of Houston's 80-plus year history and recently finished reading over 12,000 suggestions to take the university to a new level in her first 100 days. Today she's here to share her vision and that of her constituents. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. Now, I understand you uh, were born in India, and you ended up coming to the United States, age 18, on an arranged marriage. Tell me what happened. What happened after I got here? <laughs> right. Well, uh, it was a new land, new people. I had uh, barely any idea of what I was getting into, and I certainly didn't have the language. So it was a challenge, but within two months, uh, I managed to get admission in the master's program at Purdue University and work like I've never worked before, trying to get comprehension of the language as well as, uh, um, you know, just, just make any sense out of everything. So you, you showed a lot of character, though. You said you, you went into a hunger strike. You were not in favor of this marriage. You wanted a different uh, uh, life for yourself. You wanted to educate yourself. That was very important to you. Well, that's true, and it's because um, where I was in India, and at the time I was and in the community I was, I had never seen any woman in my family or in my town uh, doing anything, so to speak, after marriage. And uh, therefore, I just thought my life is over because when my parents arranged marriage, I said, this was it, this is over. So all I wanted was really to get education. That was my dream forever and ever, and I just wanted to get the highest degree possible. And my husband promised at that time, or would-be husband, uh, he promised that time, he said, you know, you, you go study as much as you want. He said, we are going to the land of opportunity. We will be in America, and America will allow you to do whatever you want. And, but I just didn't believe him because, you know, if you don't see some things, it's hard to believe. Right, and right, so right. I did go on hunger strike, but didn't make any difference, and I'm glad <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> and he, he's a Ph.D. in engineering, and yes. you both studied together at Purdue. Um, I understand you learned English watching uh, I Love Lucy and the Merv Griffin Show. Tell me about that. Well, that's true. I, I had the basic knowledge of uh, grammar, but just had no comprehension and just was not used to reading, writing, or listening. So I had to uh, watch. Uh, I watched eight hours of television a day while going to graduate school, so people do other things. That's what I did. Helped me a lot. That was the, those were the only shows I could actually follow and understand at that point in time. And you studied politi uh, public administration, right? Yes, Master's I program? did political science, and uh, my then my in my during my PhD, it was uh, public policy, public administration. That's what I focused on. What attracted you to uh, the University of Florida, uh, the next place that you ended up? Okay, from Purdue, uh, I went straight to University of South Florida. And that's because my husband uh, and I, we were both looking for a university that uh, was growing, where we both could uh, find positions, because it's not that easy in universities, or it was certainly not uh, 25 years ago, to find a place for a couple in a university. So University of South Florida, that's where we landed, uh, was growing, moving very fast and growing very fast. And uh, he took the job. I still was finishing my PhD for next two years commuting from Florida to West Lafayette, Indiana. And once I completed, uh, sure enough, uh, I was able to find a nine-month position at the University of South Florida as a trailing spouse, and the rest is history. Now, you were there for 23 years, yes. right? What are you most proud of, what your greatest achievement there? Well, um, I was there for 23 years, and uh, I changed my business card every two years. Either I got an academic promotion, which is from assistant professor to associate to full, or I got an administrative promotion, which is uh, you know department head to dean to provost. I think uh, the 23 years journey was absolutely uh, very exciting because university went from being a predominantly teaching institution to ranked in the Carnegie's top tier. So even though I was at one place, I was in different positions and university was moving so fast that it seemed like I was in three different places during this time period. So it's been very rewarding. I think every year, every experience there was very rewarding. What attracted you now to the University of Houston? Well, um, you know, I was uh, 
looking for a university that was, first of all, in a metropolitan area because uh, I think that's where the excitement is. Uh, the, the universities are based and connected with economy, and uh, today's economy is global economy, so I was looking for a global city. And Houston is a global city, very vibrant city. I was looking for a university that is ready to step outside of its box, and that it can do only when the community allows it to do. It seemed the Houston community is just... Uh, it is defined by its entrepreneurial skills, by its can-do approach, diversity, success, and people celebrating each other's success. So this just seemed like the right place for me, and uh, I'm really glad that, uh, you know, they accepted me. Now, they could have just accepted you as just president or chancellor, but they said, no, we want you to do both. What exactly does that mean? Okay, um, University of Houston today uh, consists of four institutions or four separately accredited autonomous universities. The University of Houston, then University of Houston at downtown, and University of Houston Clear Lake, and University of Houston Victoria. So all four of the universities have their own presidents, and all four presidents report to a chancellor, just like in any other system. So in this case, I'm president of the University of Houston but then I'm also chancellor for all of the universities together. So in, for once in my life, I'm reporting to myself. It's kind of nice. Now, you're the first international chancellor and, and president of the University of Houston. How do you think your, your international background affects your, your leadership style? I think uh, coming from international background and being here as an international student, uh, first of all, helps me understand uh, the value of global exposure. I cannot tell you how much I learned about India after I left India and I came here, how much I learned about my own heritage, culture, religion after I came into a different setting. At the same time, because uh, I keep my eyes uh, very close uh, to what's happening in India, it also helps me to see uh, how there are two totally different components of this global economy are reacting to global forces. But I've also taught in case, um, you know, y you may not know, but I've also lived and taught for one year in Hong Kong. So mm. I keep a very close eye in Hong on Hong Kong as well. I've also taught in Brazil. So you're, and, you're at, uh, on top of the, uh, the fastest growing economies in the world right now. Well, exactly. And, and what that does, it what I see how students are preparing themselves in those countries. Mm. They are eager not just to learn about their country, but they are eager to learn about the global uh, society. They know so much about America. They know about American paradigm, American mindset. They want to come here giving up all kinds of other things. I mean, it's very important for them to really come to America and see what it's like. I just want to see the same kind of hunger and curiosity among American students. The reason is that even if they work next door, and which most of our alumni really live in the region. I'm very proud of that. The fact is they are working in the global economy. Mm -hmm. They are competing with people and students who are getting their skills in this kind of globally exposed right, society. Right. I want them to lead this global economy. So I want them to be exposed to global mindset, global uh, cultures, uh, you know, see how other people act and react so that they can lead them. Right, right. Uh, okay, well, you just finished the 100 days. First of all, you're getting rave reviews on that. Was that your idea? And, and share with us some of the, obviously you have 12,000, but, you know, some of the surprising ones or funny ones that, and what, what you got out of it. Well, um, you know, I learned and I studied University of Houston before I came here for interview. I went to every single national database and state database to look at every single number so I can find. I went through their websites. So I knew I had the theoretical knowledge and the web and book knowledge about University of Houston. And I could see so much of potential here. And I could see some directions emerging. But I just didn't want to be presumptuous and know what's good for the University of Houston because I know it takes a great community to build a good university and a great university. So I wanted to really hear from the community what their aspirations are. What do they think University of Houston could be and should be in five and ten years? 
So I thought it would be a great idea because I'll be learning about the community and the university anyway. Might as well declare that as a learning period. So I said, let it be 100 days because some point in time I have to say, okay, <laughs> you know, this is that period right. and now yeah, let's move it. into yeah. the action phase. So right. we just declared it at 100 days. And I know brainstorming with the staff here, even before I came here, uh, after my appointment and before I joined, I remember brainstorming and, and you know, the projection was we'll probably get, you know, a few hundred responses. And uh, it's just, it's, I think it just beyond, it's beyond everybody's imagination. Now we are at 12,000 suggestions. I asked the community, internal and external, to give me my charge. And I do have 12,000 charges now. Now, were you surprised with any of those? And we'll talk a little bit about what, what came out of that. Were you surprised with, number one, the, the response that you got and, and what they said? Well, um, the, the response says that I got the, the size and the volume. It did not surprise me at all, uh, but it was very heartwarming. It was good to know that people are engaged. Mm. It was great to receive uh, so many comments from students. It tells you that they take ownership in this university because they are going to be the alumni tomorrow. And that means if they take ownership of this university, it's going to go places. In terms of surprises in those responses, yes, there was um, one big surprise, which I, I doubt if any other university went and did this kind of thing, that they would find such unanimous support behind a single idea. And the idea being people are hungry for this university to become a top tier public okay. research university. Generally, it takes two, three years of exploration and dialogue for people to get to that point where they say, okay, we want to be that. I came here and the community is ready, internal and external. So that was to me a, a surprise, a pleasant surprise that way. Was there some unpleasant surprises for me? Nothing that I would not expect in a metropolitan university that has been growing so fast, that's right in the middle of a growing, vibrant city. Uh, people want to see more engagement. Alumni want to feel more connected. Mm -hmm. Students want to uh, feel better served. And uh, community want to see better access and success mm -hmm. for students. Businesses and industry want to see better workforce preparation as well as uh, a, a more vibrant environment for creative ideas. So I don't think there was any surprises on that and I mean, I was fully prepared. I came from a metropolitan university and I know what to expect here. Mm. The other thing that was very heartwarming for me also was I knew about the diversity of the city as well as of the university. I knew the numbers. What is very interesting is how diversity has just completely integrated itself. If you walk uh, 10 minutes in this university, you will hear at least 10 different languages yes. are spoken. Mm -hmm. But what you will hear is also, you will see is that there are people from all different racial backgrounds together. Mm -hmm. They're not in They're a small mixed. separate groups. As for the community, I'm just amazed how open, embracing, and welcoming people are. We're good folk. You really <laughs> are. I mean, we would, we would be invited to somebody's home and we are there for 20 minutes and it seems like we've known them forever. Right, right. People, um, people are unpretentious. I mean, I could spend 45 minutes with the, some of the wealthiest people here and they would never feel the need to talk about their wealth. I mean, it's really a phenomenal place. You know, you, you mentioned top tier. Let, let's explain what that is and how we get there. It has to do with research. Okay. And it has to do with money. Okay. Well, you know, the top tier obviously means automatically there's a tiering involved. So I, you know, top tier, people talk about top tier. I generally like to say it nationally competitive. Right. Okay. What does nationally competitive mean? I mean, I can define to you what it means, but the fact is until other people say you are nationally competitive or you are in the top tier, you're not. You're not. Mm -hmm. How would you know that you have arrived? There are self, several organizations nationally who do the sort of, not necessarily tiering, but they do classifications. And um, we are trying to see right at this point as to where we are at the University of Houston. What would it take for us to be in some of those classifications? Uh, there are two particular. One is done by Carnegie Foundation, and the other one is done by Top American Research University, and they are specific measures. 
and how far we are and what kind of fuel it would take for us to get there. Now, one thing I want to really point out, because even though we use the word top-tier research university, public research university, and it's important for Houston to have a top-tier, nationally competitive public research university, simply because the kind of footprint University of Houston leaves on this region, 12,000 graduates a year. Mm -hmm. Most of them stay around. It means the quality of life in this, in this region is integrated, depends on the quality of education, right. the innovation, the creativity, the curiosity of the people who graduate from the University of Houston. The top tier research universities also provide a top tier learning environment for students. So the two are always so closely connected, the student learning as well as the environment for research and creativity, which is important for cutting edge ideas. So we have to make an effort in all three directions, you know, if we want to be in top tier. One, we have to provide the most cutting, cutting edge, creative innovation environment that other cities with whom Houston it's finds competing. itself competing have. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I just don't think the city of Houston can go as far as its potential is. Right, right. Secondly, we have to pay very close attention to both access and success issues for students. We want to make sure that the University of Houston keeps its doors open to students from all kinds of backgrounds who want to come to the university. But when they come here, they should have greater opportunities, greater options available. And they should have a guarantee that once they come here, they will have the environment that will make them successful. From graduating from the university and successful once they go to the real world. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that's going to be very important for us is to synchronize ourselves, to become one with the city. Because you cannot be in a metropolitan city sitting in an ivory tower. I mean, University of Houston has never had those walls around it. It's a very it's much a, it's a university that is integrated with the city, but we just need to do a lot more in terms of combining our strengths with the strengths of the city. So as the city rises, so does the university. The, the university of, it has a, a reputation uh, for being a commuter school. Uh, and to, to get to that top tier, mm -hmm. probably that needs to change. What are your goals to make the university more of a, a, a real university right. um, and not a commuter uni type university where there's community within the right. campus? Right. Well, first of all, I'm very happy and proud that uh, a metropolitan university, public university like University of Houston, provides access to those students who want to live at their homes and just commute to the university. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. However, even for commuter students, we can provide a very solid um, university life experience so that maybe they'll spend a couple of more hours at the university. Maybe, maybe they'll feel more engaged coming to games, to arts uh, venues. So right now, 4,000 students live on campus. We are building another 1,000 beds on campus in Calhoun lofts that are going up very fast. Our master plan calls for a total of 11,000 bed capacity on the university as a residential campus. But one other thing we can do, and that is there are many uh, living places around, many apartment complexes where students live. We are exploring opportunities to see how we can provide educational programming on those sites so the students get an added value for being part of a university community, even though they're living in apartments that are not necessarily owned by the university. And if we can provide them with free transportation and sort of embrace that entire area as being an area that is affiliated with the university in terms of educational programming, mm -hmm. I think that itself is going to do a lot. And we just have to do um, a few more things. There are many metropolitan universities that provide a very solid uh, environment for commuter students as well as residential and uh, we'll be looking at their best practices and um, over the next five years we are going to develop. Now all most universities have to uh, to tap their alumni yes. for funding. What are your plans in doing that and bringing the alumni more in touch with the university, more connected to the university and, right. and giving more to the university? Yes, well I'm glad uh, <laughs> you asked that question. 
because one of the things of being in that top tier or even moving up in tier is really how engaged your alumni are. To give you an example for U.S. News and World Report rankings or rankings for top American research university, they count your alumni participation. For University of Houston, 5% of alumni give back to the university. For universities that are in that top tier, you know, it's 15 to 18% give, at least. That's the minimum threshold. So we have a challenge there. Our alumni, who I totally understand why they may feel left out because the university hasn't reached out to them, will now look for things from the university that will allow them to come and engage with the university. It's giving with your money, but it's also giving with your wisdom, with your experiences. We have students, we teach and train so many first generation students who do not have necessarily role models in their families, but our alumni can become their role models. And if they see that this is what is possible, I mean, our alumni are CEOs, Pulitzer Prize winners, they're Olympians. I mean, they are excelling in every single field. And if our students can learn from them, be in touch with them, see them on campus, I think it will go a long way, and I think it will be meaningful for alumni too. So we have to create venues for alumni to be part of the university, to be a stakeholder in building our future. So those are some of the things I think the Alumni Association as well as the university are, are looking very closely. Now, what's your vision for the university in the next five years? Obviously, you have to raise a lot more money. You have to get more alumni involved. You probably need, you need to build more, more facilities. Right. What's your vision? Well, first of all, university is there for students. I want to make sure that university reaches out to the community, to the entire region, provides access to wherever people need access. And we can do that by using our University of Houston system. You should be able to enter anywhere in this system network. Whether you are entering in Pearland, you can enter in on Cinco Ranch, or maybe other new sites that we may end up opening. You can enter anywhere, or you can start in community college, do two years of community college, then you come to do two years at one of the institutions, and you should be seamlessly able to enter to the best of the professional programs or doctoral programs. So we should be able to provide students access and access to the very best of the programs as long as they're academically prepared to do so. Secondly, we must commit to provide them with the very best learning environment and supportive environment within the university once they come here. If we will look at our graduation rates, our persistence rate, what are the factors that are um, sort of forcing students out of the university and how do we take care of those four factors better so that students stay and graduate and graduate in fields that are relevant to them. We'll be looking at are we offering enough degrees in energy health sector because those are important things for Houston. Are we meeting the workforce need? If not, what more can we do to meet the workforce needs? So to me, that's a very important piece of it. Within this context about preparing students, one thing that is very exciting that um, we're doing and that is undergraduate research experience. The question is, why would a 17-year-old or a 27 or so to speak, 37-year-old would want to come to a research university rather than going to any other kind of institution? What is there that a research university does that others don't? And that is creation of knowledge. So if we have to offer a value added to students for being a part of the research university, we have to give them that value added experience. So our undergraduate research program now takes a freshman, puts that person in, within the, the confines of creation of knowledge in a lab along with, where the, along with all these postdocs and doctoral students and professors where new discoveries are being made or puts it in touch with the project where a professor is um, writing a new book or, or writing a new fiction to see exactly how it is done. So that program, I think, is going to be extremely excited. But that's only first thing, what I want to see for the University of Houston in the next five years. Second th thing, I really think it's very important for the University of Houston or UFH to, to provide that top-tier, cutting-edge 
learning and creative environment become the very top nationally competitive public research university. And the reason for that is those are students who want to stay in the region, they need options. They should be able to go to a smaller setting to a larger setting, and I think it's important. I'm sorry we have to end it there. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Anu Kator. I appreciate having you. Thank you. And that's our show for tonight. For more information on Chancellor Kator, you can visit uofh.edu. Don't forget, we're always interested in what you have to say, and so if you have a question or a comment about the show, call us at 713-743-8513 or contact us at houstonpbs.org. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.